Thank you, uh, Hans Jörg, for providing this background. I'm now starting with an introduction on the refinement aspects of the project. I will try to catch up some time. I will not be able to do it in 10 minutes, but um, well, we see that we can uh, save some of the coffee break. Um, so my name is Kenneth Neudeke. I work for the Dutch National Library, the National Library of the Netherlands, and also do the uh, Work Package 2, which is the refinement work package, so the processing refinement of the content in the project. And this is what I'm going to quickly talk about. So yeah, it's really just an introduction. We will um, really dive more into all these topics um, over the next two days. Um, but just to get you started, I'm going to talk a bit about the, the objectives of the work and um, particular challenges that we see in it. Um, and give you a bit of an overview of the data that we received from the partners and that we're going to be refining in the project. That is quite interesting because you see, while it's all newspapers, there's actually quite a, a variety of what, you, what there are in newspapers. And then um, just um, some introductory slides about the technologies, uh, the workflow that we use in the project for the refinement. And um, yeah, then yeah, depending on uh, what time left, uh, there will be questions and answers. Otherwise, you're always happy to, to interrupt me during the presentation if you have questions or just follow up in one of the uh, coffee sessions or something. Yeah, so um, just very quickly about the objectives. So yeah, we um, first of all, we had to, of course, um, look out there what is already digitized, what is available in terms of content, and what is really suitable also for this project. So, for example, you would not uh, prefer to take like really old material where the refinement technologies would probably not deliver as, um, as good results. So there are some, uh, some features that you need to consider in the material selection. Um, we also defined uh, requirements um, for what we need uh, in terms of quality of delivery, for example, um, newspapers per issue, um, supplements, all these kinds of things um, need to be really very strictly defined how uh, this should be delivered to the technical partners because as we see 10 million newspapers, it's a lot of a lot of material in um, about two years that we have for the technical processing. Um, we did a project um, ourselves in our library, um, digitizing our newspaper collection, which is 8 million, and a lot of please help me out, it was more than two years, I think, <coughs> about that. So, but we're trying to do that with a consortium of 18 partners across Europe, so there's also logistic challenges, and so 10 million is really a lot. So it needs a very, very strict uh, coordination also. And well, um, we assume that we, um, we will be successful with this and then we learn a lot from this and we want to share that knowledge of course. So um, probably right towards the, the last uh, year of the project we're also going to publish all our findings, lessons learned in the forms of recommendations um, for other libraries, how they could start such a process, how they could set it up. Um, yeah, just very quickly about the challenges. So um, there is definitely a trade-off here uh, between uh, processing speed of throughput and quality that can be achieved. So um, also other projects that we did in the past, Impact was one, uh, rather big one about OCR, showed that um, there are some uh, some thresholds in OCR in content if you really do very detailed analysis of your content and then configure your tools to fit very closely to that material. But um, you cannot realistically do that on, on such scale. So um, we have to provide a lot of automation in this process. So as hans Jörg already said, out of the 10 million newspapers, 8 million will be processed fully automatically. And um, well, we also, we, we really need to um, consider these things like these uh, special characteristics like for example these supplements, special format, sizes, etc. Um, in the whole organization of the workflow because it needs to be smooth, it needs to be fast. Um, well we also have um, in the material selection we have to consider of course all these things like access rights. We want to give um, access to these newspapers in the portal uh, that will be built by the European Library. Um, but the metadata will also be ingested to Europeana, which um, according to the data exchange agreement means the metadata needs to be free, CC0. So there are also access restrictions uh, in terms of what we can actually use in the project, what we can ingest. 
And well, um, as you will see in a second, there's a huge variety, of course, in the content in all kinds of characteristics related to fonts, to, to, to layouts, to languages used, etc. So yeah, this is just a quick blink. Um, just took some of the of the newspaper subtitle pages from the partners, and you see there's already quite some variation. That's uh, too small really to, to, to see it, but there's all kinds of alphabets. We have here well the standard Latin type, but we also have a lot of uh, German-speaking uh, countries use the uh, the old Gothic or fracture broken letter font type. We have uh, Ottoman fonts from the National Library of Turkey. We have uh, Cyrillic, um, all sorts of stuff in a, in a big mix. You also see we have uh, newspapers which are color, which are gray, which are only in black and white. So these are all things that need to be taken care of in the, in the refinement. Um, this is just to give you a quick idea of, um, I hope you can read it about the uh, amount of pages that we get per partner refined and how they are distributed in the two workflows. So basically it's these two workflows of 8 million um, which are done fully automatically um, with OCR and 2 million that's here the indicated in the red um, where also layout uh, uh, analysis and segmentation is applied. And yeah, you can see a lot of, a lot of content uh, from the, from the French National Library, the Austrian National Library, uh, libraries that have already been uh, starting or completing digitization programs, large scale digitization programs, but also uh, many, many other smaller libraries with smaller amounts of content. Um, yeah, that's what I've been mentioning. So, um, the diversity of the font types. Um, this is important, especially for the OCR, because you need to tell your OCR. Uh, system, your technology, what kind of fonts it will, um, it will discover in the documents and um, so for example if you have also documents which, which have a combination of fonts um, that is very important information for the configuration of the technologies otherwise you may for example only be able to detect the um, say the Latin alphabet part of the newspaper but if it has a curly part that will not be detected. And so we see here we have, yeah, some in some cases we have like um, up to up to three um, different uh, font types. I'm wondering actually, the Ottoman and the uh, Cyrillic is not even listed here, but um, so about five or six uh, different font categories that we have to distinguish. Um, the same basically holds true with language also. So um, if you plan to do OCR, you need to tell the OCR system what language the documents you want to recognize are written in. Um, also here, typically you can have a combination of languages. We have uh, in our collection in the Netherlands, we have a couple of newspapers which are, for example, uh, half the page is in Dutch, the other half of the page is in French. So your OCR system needs to know that, otherwise, if you have just configured it for Dutch to French, uh, text will not be recognized. You also have uh, historical language. Of course, if you look in a newspaper of the 18th century, the spelling was uh, quite different than uh, probably what it is nowadays. <coughs> also, this is important because in some cases the OCRs are able to support historical languages and if there are resources, technical resources to do that, you get much better results from uh, your refinement process. So, you really need to know your content. Basically, this is uh, the bottom line. I would, I would, I would say. And sometimes this information you don't have it in your catalog. Uh, sometimes you do. Sometimes you have some information like the main language of the document, but you may not have the information what other languages occur in these documents. <coughs> this is really important if you if you plan to do such refinement uh, processes that you analyze your content, you find out about these characteristics and you know what is really the best configuration for your material. Um, this is just, um, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a nice visualization. It doesn't really tell very much, but um, it shows across all the partners uh, the time frames covered of the newspaper collection that we're going to process in this project. So you see we have really content that's, um, I think, the earliest content from the, from the Dutch National Library from 1618. <coughs> But in some cases we go here up into the second half of the 20th century. Um, so there are some libraries here, up to 2000 we even have some content. That's 
do have, uh, in some cases, agreements with publishers that allow us to provide that content. But all in all, it's a, it's a rather even spread, and of course, naturally, the most uh, being available in the 18th and 19th centuries. Okay, so much about the content. So um, now um, to talk about the workflow for a bit. Um, I'm not sure if you can read it in the back also. Um, so this is a really uh, a simplified version, um, basically just showing, so in green that's more or less um, the preparation steps that the libraries um, have to execute. So there's the selection of the titles, um, taking into consideration these um, characteristics that I've just mentioned, but also taking into, into consideration, of course, um, things as, such as um, user demands, um, <coughs> the um, physical shape of the collection, um, etc. I've already mentioned we need to uh, determine the usage rights because there are some um, requirements in order to be able to get that data supplied to the European Union. So that is another thing that cuts down uh, the selection. And then we have this thing which we employed in the project which we call the master list. Basically this is um, a web page, um, you could say, um, where all this information is registered for all the partners. So that's very important for us. Um, the technical partners can access the information and learn about the characteristics of a particular newspaper. The information is here collected on a title level. So you have all the characteristics of one particular title and the technical partners can then configure their workflows, their technologies according to this information. But it also serves us um, as a tracking tool. So we can see, okay, what newspapers are currently being refined, um, what is in the process, what is already done, etc. This is very important to really have like, a, a common overview of all this content in the project and at all times to be aware um, what are the particular characteristics of a certain collection. If you encounter problems in the processing, you can look at these characteristics and, and maybe come, uh, come up with some solution about it. Okay, so um, say we've uh, completed this first row, so the newspapers have been selected, they, all the information has been collected and has been entered into this list. Then uh, there are some uh, additional pre-processing steps that uh, the libraries have to do. Um, that's um, here what I have like in orange and green because there is what we provide tools for from the technology partners. And that is first of all binarization. So uh, binarization, that's the conversion of uh, an image which is either in grayscale or color to a purely black and white image which is only black and white pixels. Um, this is something where well, you I think it's not always recommendable perhaps for, uh, for newspapers which have sometimes uh, um, bad image, bad paper quality um, and you want to preserve as much information um, that is on the page as possible. However, um, the thing is also if you look at 10 million pages of newspapers and grayscale images you may know they take a lot of uh, disk space. So you may have a newspaper page, newspaper pages generally are rather big can be easily uh, up to 40, 50 megabytes only for one page. So um, if you think that we will refine 10 million pages and to try to do the maths, um, which we did in the beginning of the project, we found out it's the sheer amount of data is extremely large and it's not really easy to ship that data all across Europe via internet. Internet connections are getting better. Our uh, our native Chris is working on it uh, to have broadband uh, all over Europe, but it's still not really on that scale that we could easily transfer such such amounts. So um, we needed to find a way to reduce the data size. Now you must know that as part of OCRing, uh, binarization, so the conversion to black and white, is um, an, an obligatory step. So it's something that happens anyway um, when you whenever you are OCRing uh, a document. It's just that um, there are different approaches to convert to black and white. You can do a conversion which is for the human eye, to make it more readable, to make it more crisp. But this is not necessarily what is, works best for an OCR engine. So um, what we have done here, we have um, in uh, IMPACT, an OCR research project, we have worked with some partners who are really at the, at the forefront of the research and we have um, a tool which does this binarization, 
but specifically optimized for um, text recognition. So we did some tests and we found we could dramatically reduce the file size, but um, we didn't really suffer any loss in the quality of the text recognition. So this is very important. Otherwise, um, I would generally recommend avoiding black and white, especially in the scanning, but you can do it in a later step um, without losing a lot of accuracy if you have to write tools for it. Okay, so the other two things, um, I will I also have slides about that, so I will not talk about that uh, very much now, So, but there is also um, a specification about how the files need to be named, about how they need to be structured, um, that allows us to really just ingest that material into these automated workflows and process it without really a lot of uh, manual effort and configuration. So, and then the, the actual refinement happens at the technical partners, so that's the, the OCRing and OLRing, and uh, for a small amount, uh, the NER, which actually comes later, that's true. So, um, yeah, Innsbruck and um, Hamburg, that's uh, CCS, are processing the data and they're delivering. Um, in the end, an uh, Europeana uh, newspaper package, um, I think it's called, um, which is um, a Metz Alto package um, that contains the structural information, the full text in Alto format, and also uh, images for presentation. And then at, at this stage, yeah, um, we will also do for a small amount, uh, we will track these uh, named entities, as Hans Jörg mentioned. And now I'm going to talk a bit more about these tools. Ah, oh, yeah, here you can see, you will probably not see this master list. So it's a, it's a very big list with a lot of information in it. I think currently we have something like um, almost 600 titles there. And for every title, we really have every information like you see here. The, the, the title, of course, the catalog identifier, the amount of pages, the file size uh, per page, um, the dates when it was published, links to an online version, everything you can imagine. Okay, tools. So, yeah, coming back to this workflow, um, you see it, so binarization is the first step, and um, luckily here we have um, a tool that was developed by the University of Innsbruck, which supports the libraries in this process. So, they get this tool, it's um, a Windows tool which has a graphical user interface, so it's really easy to use, and the purpose of this is to do this uh, conversion, so it takes this uh, binarization tool from this other partner and provides it in a very uh, usable uh, way. And um, it also is, um, it can process these files very fast. So if you have a powerful machine with, with many cores, um, it, it uses that and um, you can process whole collections rather quickly. Um, there's all sorts of uh, status information in the tool that allows you really to follow the, the, the progress and um, track the results. And so, so far we, we are quite happy with how this is going. Um, there's then another tool, the second tool, that's the file rename tool. Um, this was done because, like I said, it's very important um, for the technical partners that the data that arrives um, for them to process is um, according to the same formatted and uh, um, delivered according to the same characteristics need to be uh, according to a specific scheme uh, because the software um, extracts information from that. Um, the hierarchy of the directories where the files are stored is very important because the automated processing has been configured to uh, accept only certain structures. For example, you want all the pages uh, for one newspaper in one directory or something like that. But you also want to have the information that this directory is that particular newspaper. So there are some uh, requirements and specifications. These are also actually um, available on our website. It's a deliverable uh, that you can find on our website which describes this in more detail. And it's um, probably worth um, thinking about these things because we encountered really when processing documents at scale the issues that are actually most uh, challenging are things like, okay, how can I get the files in the right structure? How can I um, get all the pages of one document in one directory, for example, of one newspaper? So how the data is really organized, how the files are organized, that can play a very important role if you really want to process a lot of data in a short time. <coughs> Basically, you want to avoid any outliers. 
And finally, there is um, then the FUD tool, the file analyzer tool. Um, so this is, um, I would say, almost the most important tool because this is a quality checking tool that you apply once you have um, done this binarization, when you have done all this uh, renaming of your files using the other two tools. Then we use the FUD tool and it will check your data before you send it to any of the technical partners and tell you whether it is correct. So this checks for all these uh, specifications, requirements that we have um, set out. And um, you will see here, um, it's really, it's color coded, so it will light up green for all the steps that you have already successfully done. But if there is something that you're still missing or that is incorrect according to the specification, it will be highlighted in red and it will tell you what you can do about it. We also use this um, to provide log information, so we really have a guarantee um, for the technical partners that the data that has been provided is correct, is according to the specification, so um, this is very important. Okay, so then the data has been provided in the correct format, the real refinement can happen. And that is uh, now, um, as we learned, um, the biggest part of it is just uh, automatic uh, optical character recognition done by the University of Innsbruck. Um, they have um, a nice cluster there that is very powerful and can process this, this large amount of data in that short time period. And um, it's using a technology um, some of you may be familiar with. It's um, a commercial OCR engine, a fine reader. Um, but um, that we found also working on other projects just to be the, the most suitable uh, technology for really doing such um, processing on a large scale and still keeping a very good uh, accuracy threshold. Um, in fact, here um, the, the finally the software development kit is used, so there are different products for different purposes, uh, desktop products, there's a server product, in this case um, that has been integrated by the University of Innsbruck into their um, their own uh, in-house technologies. And yeah, it's, um, it's quite powerful because it's the, currently the only OCR engine we are aware of that can out of the box support all these different um, font types, especially the old uh, German uh, Fraktur font type, but also um, others like uh, Cyrillic, Arabic, etc. And uh, does that with a, with a rather good accuracy. So, um, this has been used uh, for these 8 million pages um, with a fully automatic configuration, but at least we try to do the configuration as detailed as possible based on these characteristics that I've mentioned before, font type, uh, time frame, etc. And um, Innsbruck does an additional step. So, um, this OCR engine by default, it provides uh, output in many formats, but it will just provide you one file per page which has the full text and maybe some layout information in it. But then um, there would also be at Innsbruck produced uh, METS files. So METS which is an XML which describes really the structure of the document. And um, so this will also be produced and so the libraries at the end of this process they will get this METS auto package that um, Maybe we'll also hear uh, a bit more about it tomorrow, I'm not sure, but it's really, it's um, in the terms of uh, the Open Archive Information System, it's a submission information package, I think, is it? So, um, for those of you who are familiar with these terms, that's, that's a, a standard <coughs> package that you would also, for example, get when working with a, with a digitization service provider. Yeah, then we have this um, other process. Oh, and then actually I wanted to show something. Yeah, I will, I will do it later. Um, you will also hear about um, both of these uh, processing steps, uh, the OCRing and the OLRing, a bit more tomorrow. Today we will dive then um, after after break more into the quality control aspects, but tomorrow there will also be sessions to where we will hear more about these uh, particular refinement steps. So um, there's also a hands-on session uh, with Klaus Kartenhorst from CCS where um, there will be uh, uh, demos and uh, opportunities to really see um, this uh, solution, that um, DocWorks solution from CCS. And um, so here that's again uh, the, the Epi Finder engine, but it's uh, integrated with a more sophisticated, more advanced uh, technology system. Um, that allows also such things as we've heard, the, the separation of articles, um, the correction of, of the segmentation, for example, can be offered as a manual QA step. 
Um, it classifies uh, pages according to certain uh, page classes like advertisements, illustrations, uh, etc. And um, so this is a very powerful uh, system if you want to really um, structure your digital newspapers according to the characteristics of the original physical document. It's however, it's a bit more uh, complex and um, time intensive process, so um, in the project only two million uh, of the content will be refined uh, using that technology. Again, here we get um, as output of this whole process at the end, we get um, a Metz Alta package conforming to the metadata best practice that we developed in the project. That's what uh, Hans Jörg mentioned will be uh, there will be a public release of this uh, metadata description in October. So this is very nice that um, actually no matter if you are, your data is processed by the one partner or by the other partner, in the end you get a package which is according to the same standards and specifications, a uniform package. Um, oh sorry, I'm already much over time so I will try to really finish up quickly. Um, so then, um, yeah, for last uh, step, we have then named entity recognition. We have also here a hands-on session tomorrow where we, where you can really see some tools, play around with it uh, yourself, uh, do some testing. Um, this is done in my library. We're using uh, technology that has been developed um, at Stanford University. Um, actually, the, the, the tool is online, as open source. If you're a technician, if you're interested, you can just uh, get it on our GitHub. And this allows us basically to um, detect normalized, um, uh, standardized names uh, of persons, of places, of organizations in the text. And so this um, allows you to, 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 to do some uh, specific search scenarios. I will try, if I maybe still have two minutes, I can show you. Okay, so um, before any questions, maybe I just take these two minutes and show you some uh, examples of um, what, what is the value of all this? So, um, <coughs> there is, well, once you have this full text, uh, the big advantage is really, okay, you can do search. You can not only search metadata and maybe get like 1,000 hits of title descriptions, but you can really search for keywords and get to those particular keywords in the text. And um, there is this newspaper browser that will provide this portal to access the newspapers in this way, which is built by the European Library. Um, there will be no uh, session um, really about this here today, but I would very much recommend you to go to our website. And um, in the news you can find a blog uh, entry just a couple of weeks ago, building a content browser for digital newspapers. And here you will see some wireframes, some examples of what the presentation uh, interface will look like. And we very much invite anyone to give feedback to this, to just comment on this, or send us an email, give us your opinion. If you have some portal of your own, maybe um, let us know about it. So um, have a look at this. We're very interested in your feedback about this. Um, just some very quick thing about the named entities. So this is actually um, from another project where I've worked uh, on before in German library. But here we have done this uh, refinement with named entities, for example. And you can see here if I go to, I just key in something. Let's see if we can find this for Belgrade, actually. Yes, we do. So I can now just go to this uh, title, for example, and I have here on the left, I can look for um, all the person names that were detected in this document. So I can now see, okay, it talks about all these people, and if I click on one, it will actually show me where uh, this person has been mentioned in the text. And it will also put this highlighting on it. So especially with a newspaper, that's very important. You don't want to know that uh, this person name has been found somewhere on a page with, I don't know, five to 10,000 words, and you have to read every article to find it, but you want to really have that highlighting that gives you immediately the position of that hit. And finally, this is what uh, Hans Jörg already mentioned. This is something uh, that we did actually in our library with our newspapers. We added these geolocations. So that actually on your smartphone, for example, it only works in the Netherlands, obviously. Um, 
um, you can just um, download this app, install it, and it will show you um, what newspaper articles have been published about the place where you are currently located. And so, but if you have like a smartphone, you cannot really display a newspaper page that size without a lot of zooming in and scrolling around. So for that, you really want to have like one article for itself, separated, because that usually that like fits rather okay to a smartphone size. You can read it. Uh, quite okay. So these are these uh, application scenarios that are only possible when you do these uh, a bit more refined technologies uh, like the OLA. And with this I wrap up and um, yeah, invite you to have coffee or ask me anything. <laughs>